Good morning. Um, it's a pleasure this morning to share a few thoughts that um, I, along with several colleagues and other collaborators, have developed. Um, looking at geotechnology innovation, innovations in geotechnical engineering, innovations in our field of geotechnical engineering. This is something we have the privilege of doing and the opportunity to pursue in the future. So what is it? What, are, what is this process? It's a transformative process applying scientific knowledge to develop practical, for practical purposes, developing practical solutions for the earth and relating to the earth using earth as its building material overall. We innovate on every project we work on. We continuously do first time builds, one offs. That's why we love this profession. We're attracted to this overall. Our number one mandate from the very beginning, and this will never change in my opinion, is that we have to provide the functionality but at a level of safety and acceptable risk to our society overall. This is unique for us in many ways. It's a beautiful challenge in that we we have to get it right on our first attempt, on every attempt for every project. We aren't allowed redos. We can't just uh, send updates to the site, so to speak. Um, we don't have the luxury of trial and error. And this is different than other professions and other disciplines and other services. Somehow I pay Apple to continuously be fixing my phone, and it's also considered a finished product. We don't do that. And so, as a result, we build things for the long term. We build things today, which will last for its service life, 30 to 50 years. In all realities, it might be used for 100 years. And increasingly, particularly for closures and things, we have the obligation to design things in perpetuity. And so with that, I want us to develop and first think about some perspective, looking back to about the 1890s, looking um, to our present day and then moving forward. So let's consider the intersection of market and Embarcadero in San Francisco. That's the red star. This is in the late 1800s. And at that point in time, you can see what San Francisco was at the time, a budding city. It had the Transcontinental Railroad for some access. There was not a Panama Canal yet, but they needed access to, to um, develop the city overall. There was substantial mud flats. There was tidal marshes. They had trouble with boats and navigation. And so it was conceived an idea to build a seawall to reclaim acres of land through a series of processes where they could have a port. They could have an active and access to the ocean to bring ships in and out overall. And so the design, inspired by past work on the East Coast and in Europe, was a, a embankment fill rip wrap for protection on the front, hydraulic fill behind it overall. About the same time, maybe perhaps they used our beautiful tool of the SPT to take the first samples and take a look at things. And pile driving, either by gravity or with um, steam power, would have been able to install that front um, wharf and that, and that waterfront facility overall. That worked well, it, it, amazing engineering. Uh, at that point in time, largely leveraging a substantial manpower, leveraging um, gravity um, as well. And materials at that time were essentially considered endless or thought to be endless. They might have been difficult to access, but certainly we thought that they were infinite. Subsequent time over the intervening years, first the 1906 earthquake at that same location caused substantial damage. Perhaps the settlements there are due to something which was later termed liquefaction, and we came to understand that. And then again in 1989 with Loma Prieta, we were reminded of the same thing. And so through this time, our discipline is becoming established. It is becoming developed. And we could plot out and map zones where we'd have expected damage, likely from liquefaction across the city of San Francisco. And so now in present day, we are sitting here, same place. There are consultants, um, perhaps some in this room that have been have won projects to revamp and redevelop this waterfront to increase its stability and its performance into time future. The tools being used now, a cone penetrometer, sonic drilling, geophysics, other types of instruments as well. Various types of ground improvement and stabilizing technologies are being considered, and so there are a whole bunch of different solutions being conceived to stabilize in substantial volumes um, new solutions. 
These solutions are designed to be incredibly strong, to be incredibly robust, to withstand any and all that nature and its shaking can push at us. They rely heavily on steel and concrete, and diesel is the primary source of energy used, and we use a lot of all of them right now, overall, in these solutions. So what does the future look like? Let's take and think through where we are at and what, how our mentality has changed. In the 1800s, the societal mandate to us as civil engineers was the establishment, help us establish this city as a viable place west of the Mississippi where we could have and be uh, a successful um, commerce. Performance was important, but reasonable performance was accepted. It was costly, no doubt, at that point in time. The thought process of, sustain of sustainability was not with us at that point in time. Our discipline was really construction. It wasn't an engineering field. And again, our resources we largely thought of as being infinite. And so we progress forward to the present day, and now we are designing resilient infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure that can withhold, that can withstand the largest loads overall. Our performance expectations have gone up. We're starting to talk about those in a probabilistic terms. The thresholds have been brought down. Cost has also certainly gone up with this. And maybe 10 years ago, when you're thinking about sustainability, the first thing that came to mind is the EIRs and the other reports and permitting that we have to get done to get our projects <laughs> moving forward. Certainly, we now are a formal discipline. We um, have these conferences. We have educational programs. We have our ASCE. We have these established societies overall. And we think of resources as being expensive uh, and increasingly expensive overall. But what about the future? We talked about innovation, and we want to look forward. So I picked a time frame of about 2040 to 2050, only 30, 20 to 30 years out from now. It's not that long, but, but technology innovation is accelerating in time. So perhaps the progress we've made over the last 100 years, we might now see in the next 30 years. How, what, what is our mandate from society now? To be optimized, to be sustainable? Certainly our performance expectations will be the same. We we'll probably describe them in a different way. We'll, we might expect and desire more adaptability as we go forward. Our costs will go up. They'll go up even more if we invest heavily in developing sustainable technologies. But now sustainability itself is going to come to the forefront. It has to, in my mind. And so we are a geotechnical engineering profession, now within a systems engineering mindset overall. And we view our resources, the construction materials, the energy we use, and everything else as being finite and as being impactful. So what might this look like moving forward? To do that, let's take a, a look at two things. First of all, the the sustainability, or really sustainable development. The development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, there's two neat things about this. One is the things we build today, we are already, in some ways, providing for our future generations because of the longevity of the things that we build overall. But at the same time, everything we consume today is going to be taking away, potentially, from future generations. And this is obviously the normal things of concrete and diesel and those types of things. But it's also how we use every project site. If I build something into the ground that cannot be re reversed or be reused by a future development at that site, I am taking away. So there's always a cost associated with this. The second part is the thought process of bio-inspired design, process of conceiving and developing engineering solutions inspired or based on biological structures or processes. So why do I propose this? Why do I think about this? And the reason is that nature functions beginning with a finite amount of energy to invest, and it works down from there. It is limited. It can only do so much and a finite amount of investment with the energy it has. It takes energy to consume energy. That is, it takes energy for organisms to eat. It takes energy for organisms to move, to go to food, to go to shelter, to ex exist and to, and to subsist, um, and it, it needs it to survive overall. They don't have a currency like the dollar where they can purchase extra. It is only what they are able to consume themselves and that's what they're limited to. So the way nature works is in a finite mentality, a limited resource mentality. 
So we can look at a few different topics and think through this. We can think of site characterization. Certainly in the past, in the 19, going from 1890s in the SPT to the CPT and geophones, tremendous increases, 100-fold increases in data quality, five times um, uh, reduced impacts overall. And if we go and move forward, there are different things that people at, in, in the centers are taking a look at, including peristaltic motion. And so in the top video, you can see a worm where it is penetrating at the same time radially expanding. And this has potential to be a self-reacting mechanism, a self-reacting penetrometer where we don't need the truck at the surface anymore. It might be able to penetrate through the surface, penetrating horizontally, pursuing horizons, delineating um, the, uh, the, <laughs> the layering of the soil and the subsurface. We can think about deep foundations as well, from timber piles to strong concrete piles with large pile caps to tree root inspired type systems. On a per mass basis, the tree root foundation system has 25 times the capacity of vertically driven piles. There is potential and opportunity there. In the gravel improvement industry, going from the original sheep's foot roller constructed out of railroad ties and three foot diameter trees to the deep soil mixing uh, methods used today, largely using substantial volumes of concrete and other things, we can move towards biocementation and other technologies in the future, which already, based off of LCA analysis performed today, come in beneath those different types of technologies. We are going to see that. I believe that's going to be a reality as well. It's also going to map and have impact at higher levels. It's going to have impact in how we do health monitoring overall, going from observation and repair to the current total stations and lighting system to the other part. And the other piece that I want to talk through is on diversity and inclusion. Because just like nature, they use everyone and everything together because it gives you the best product, it gives you the best technical solutions. We can look at the boards and how those have changed. There are many different reasons for this. There are cultural reasons for it and other things. What I think I, and what I want us to focus on is that if we look forward, we can look at how our population is going to be changing over the next 30 years to 2050 there is plenty of opportunity for us to embrace this diversity, for us in our profession to have this diversity built in within our profession and to be active in that, to be an inclusive environment for all of us to be investing in that and moving forward. And that has to also be true for gender as well. That hasn't changed, but we are making progress in that area. So this is a necessary build for us to realize this innovation in the future. So with that, I am excited for where we are going. I see tremendous opportunities through the lens of sustainability in the context of bio-inspired design. It's going to be hard. It's difficult work integrating all these different, di different disciplines to do this. But I want to go forward together. I want to have fun doing it and to enjoy the process and the journey together. And I look forward in 20 or 30 years for us to be able to look at this and to be able to look back and to say we were second to none in some of these investments and in some of these initiatives as we realize this for ourselves and for our society. Thank you.